She's the Director of Strategic Operations at the FAA's commercial, uh, of, Office of Commercial Space. Dean, please. Yuri, thank you very, very much, and good afternoon, um, and uh, certainly hope that everyone did have a nice lunch, uh, and that your seatbelts are uh, pulled lo uh, uh, low and tight across your laps, because we're in for a wild ride this afternoon. Um, I thought I would start this session, uh, before I introduce our uh, esteemed panel, uh, by uh, making a few observations. I had the opportunity to sit in this morning on the, uh, the panel on unmanned um, traffic management issues. And I was struck by the amount of similarity of the discussions uh, between the, the, the drone industry, if you will, and that of the commercial space industry. Issues like integration, issues like risk mitigation, issues like the, the criticality of situational awareness, and the the conundrum that we face as a community, as an aerospace community, on how we evolve these new entrants into traditional airspace. So we're going to be touching upon a lot of these issues today. Some of you that sat in on those sessions uh, this morning, and indeed even the sessions yesterday, talking about uh, about other uh, other operational items, uh, upper classy and otherwise. You may hear some things that are similar, but I suspect you're going to hear some things that are, are brand new. So to set the stage, uh, because the, the U.S. and indeed the FAA is so heavily engaged in the commercial space industry, I thought I would just stick through a couple of slides and, uh, and put some context on what it is that the, that the U.S. is doing. So our office, uh, a 100-person office within the FAA, uh, out of a total workforce of about 47,000, uh, you can imagine we have our work cut out for us. Our uh, authority uh, directs us not only to ensure public safety uh, during a commercial space launch, but also to encourage, facilitate, and promote the industry. And that is unusual. Uh, as a regulator, you don't usually have a, a, a body within the regulatory mechanism uh, encouraging and facilitating and promoting the industry. But in fact, that is a large part of our remit. Our law, our regulatory authority, only extends to launch operations and launch facilities. And in fact, from the time that we were issued our authorities, we have only had incremental up updates. And the US Congress has drawn a line in the sand. We do not guarantee the protection of people on board uh, space vehicles. That is under law. I'm not saying it may not change in the future, but our current regulatory authority is limited. So we operate for humans going into space in an era of informed consent. So in a, in a nutshell, we issue, our office issues licensing uh, for entities that launch, to, uh, launch from the United States, a launch site, or a launch operation in the United States, and the same for re-entries. We also issue a, an FAA launch license to a U.S. entity that is launching uh, from an international location. And a really good example of that is happening this week with Rocket Lab USA, who are planning on uh, undertaking their second uh, commercial space launch from Mahia Point in New Zealand. We don't issue launch licenses for government, obviously not for DOD and not for NASA. And the last point is, we're pretty unique. As I noted, we have 100 people. Uh, we have a pretty pretty big remit. Um, and we do it all in one shop. And we do it, uh, I would also hesitate to add, we do it in coordination with other parts of the FAA. Uh, AST, my office, cannot uh, simply decide it's going to issue a launch, launch license for an operator and, and not talk to our air traffic organization about that. Our license overview um, is it's pretty pretty basic, to be very frank. We have a pre-application period, uh, we have an evaluation period, and then uh, we issue a determination on a license. If it's a yes determination, we sit through the launch and uh, are on site in the event of both successful launches or in the case of a mishap. 
This chart is pretty basic by design. I can't put time frames on here because the only set time frame is from the time we accept an application as complete enough, we have by law 180 days to either grant or reject the license application. The pre-application um, uh, period can go on for a long time uh, or it can be very short. It kind of depends on a lot of factors. As I noted, we're only focused on public safety. Um, in the future, there is a, a potential that will concern ourselves with, with the humans in the space vehicle. And in the more distant future, potentially, that we will look a lot more like the traditional FAA role in the certification of space vehicles. But again, the current, uh, the current licensing regime is limited to the left-hand block only. This is a, uh, <laughs> this is a real eye test, but uh, this is, gives you an, uh, an order of magnitude of the kind of operations uh, that we are dealing with at some level. Uh, these are a, both existing and proposed spaceports, um, and there's a color coding, the blue uh, for the existing, the uh, gold, if you will, uh, for a proposed orbitable spaceport, red for proposed suborbital spaceport and green for existing suborbital. And the key to this slide is simply that this is not, if this is not a place where it you know, happens in one or two locations in the U.S. This is indeed a worldwide uh, growing enterprise. Um, I'm going to just tick past this because I think some of my esteemed panel members have much better slides, uh, pictures of their, uh, of their craft. But again, just to give you an idea of the kind of uh, vehicles that we are, we are dealing with within the office. This graph is intended to show you how we have evolved uh, over time from the orange uh, being principally government military um, orbital launch events to the blue showing the commercial. You see that there was a spike and then a decline, um, a lot having to do with, with economics, uh, with, with you know, a lesser extent mishaps, um, but again, the, the industry is back on a pretty sure footing. And uh, when this data is updated in early February, um, I expect that we'll see a continued growth in the projections. The, uh, the orbital launch market share is uh, divided, as you might guess, um, with the, the U.S. in the blue, uh, the uh, yellow, Russia, uh, some of the more traditional launch operators that, uh, that uh, you read about on any given day in the paper. Um, I'm going through these very quickly. We have enormous amounts of data uh, that back all of these slides up, which I'm happy to talk to any of you about uh, on break or via email. Suffice it to say that it shows that there are some um, seven or eight countries that are, are actively and have been actively uh, engaged in the uh, commercial launch market. Um, we hear a lot about uh, launches and the reason and, and these, these mega constellations that are going up. And this slide actually um, has data up through October of 2017. And you see the, the quantum growth that we're seeing in the small sats. Um, this, this is a, a clear indication, certainly to my office, uh, of the, the supporting uh, increase in applications that we're seeing for new vehicles uh, and for launches themselves. Um, you know, again, this, this slide follows that, uh, that the, um, the orders for commercial launches, this data um, is pulled for us by a, a company called Bryce, um, and we see the distribution between the U.S. and Russia. Um, and, you know, it shouldn't be a surprise, I focus very heavily on what the U.S. market share looks like in, in this environment. And similarly, we are working uh, quite uh, diligently to refine our launch forecasting. Um, we have not, um, it's, a, it's a tough thing to do, to be very frank. Uh, we get a lot of data in from, from launch operators and, and from launch facilities. Um, we try to reconcile that data with, uh, certainly with what is in the queue for us in the application process, what we know uh, the issues are to be, um, and, and in fact, we look at historical data as well. 
Um, so a lot of my time is spent in strategic operations on refining metrics, and I expect that we are going to be able to uh, to close the, the gap um, that sometimes exists between the industry data and our own. This slide reflects uh, international, so, um, you know, I, someone challenged me. They said, well, it's not possible that you have so many launches, and I do want to uh, do want to underscore this is on the international um, perspective. And in that event, um, the we have a, an aggressive outreach program that was uh, that was uh, highlighted in the number of international spaceport locations we're talking to, and what our office is charged with do, with doing in the in the uh, interest of promoting uh, the U.S. industry is to assist them in their activities outside of the United States. For instance, preparing for launch, um, to share. Uh, with our international colleagues what it is that we do, how our regulatory framework is, is established, and uh, sharing with them best practices. <clears throat> and I mentioned uh, at the onset of my remarks that you know we clearly have to be concerned about interoperability in the future. Uh, for us, a really bad day for a uh, U.S. commercial launch operator would be to have to file uh, for a license in one country that's completely dissimilar from, from perhaps the requirements in the U.S. So we do, a lot of the reason we share our information is to promote that interoperability and, and harmonized approach. So again, the priorities are pretty straightforward. We lo we're looking to establish these relationships, to sustain these relationships, to advance our industry interests, and to work with bodies like ICAO and the UN Office of Outer Space Affairs um, to further the, uh, the industry objectives. Um, this is a repeat of the slide. You know, the, the, the countries that you, that you read about, the countries that have traditionally had very robust uh, launch operators are the ones that are most aggressive on the, uh, on, in terms of commercial activity. Um, a lot of the countries are developing um, their space law and their regulatory frameworks to, in, to enable uh, a commercial uh, launch economy in their own countries. And, you know, clearly as this industry matures, uh, we will be looking at the, um, at the opportunities for any country's vehicles to launch from uh, multiple countries. This is big business. Um, I think some of my colleagues are going to talk about this a little bit. Um, you know, the, first, the first bullet makes a pretty powerful point. Um, in one year alone, uh, we eclipsed what had been spent in the space industry in the last 15 years. Um, lots of money on the, on the new ventures. Lots of venture capitalists are investing in what they see as a very, very uh, promising market. And the money is uh, not surprising. A big, big chunk of the money goes to the satellite services, getting the satellites into space, these mega constellations, these small sats, um, the launch facilities themselves, and, and of course the manufacturing component. Um, Many of you, uh, particularly those in the U.S., read about the contracts that NASA has uh, with some of the commercial launch operators, uh, so it shouldn't be a surprise that a lot of the, re the revenue is coming out of uh, government contracts. Our office also has, uh, uh, has a fairly healthy research and development portfolio. Uh, we concentrate in four key areas, um, air and space traffic management, uh, space transportation vehicles, human space flight, and industry viability. And I will, uh, I will uh, at some point, hopefully this afternoon, be able to, uh, to initiate a dialogue on, on some of the items uh, that we're looking at in terms of airspace uh, integration as commercial launch operators uh, look to integrate more effectively into uh, national airspace systems. Um, and also, uh, in the area of human spaceflight, while we're not responsible for ensuring human safety, we do uh, have an eye toward the future uh, in a day that that might become one of our requirements. So part of our industry portfolio, uh, our, our research portfolio is centered on that. In terms of space transportation vehicles, it's, it's about safety. Um, so, you know, it should be no surprise to anyone in this audience that, uh, that one of the things I haven't mentioned, uh, because to me it's a foregone conclusion, everything that we do is to ensure safety. And in terms of industry viability, um, we have a very, very active program on looking at our current regulations and figuring out how we can make those uh, more efficient. 
So to summarize, our future challenges uh, are looking at the uh, the things that we call the new entrants. The, the, uh, you know, we're in a class along with the drones, the commercial space operators. How do we integrate into existing commercial operations more effectively? Um, we in the U.S. are looking at uh, space traffic management that is uh, currently uh, handled by the U.S. Department of Defense. and. Uh, thinking through if that might be uh, done at least by, in some part by, uh, by a commercial agency. I mentioned the airspace access. Uh, we have a industry, government industry group uh, literally being pulled together as I speak uh, on uh, looking at what is the criteria to ensure effective airspace access. Similarly, we're looking at the spaceports. Can we categorize those as we do airports? So it gives at least a potential launch operator an idea of what they can and can't do at any given location. We're also well aware that, uh, that Congress is, is, is keeping up to date with what, what the industry is doing. And it's entirely likely, based on information that we, are, we collect and we provide, uh, that there may be new legislation coming our way. And then, of course, you know, the, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, words of some of the people in industry, point-to-point -point commercial space travel is not that far away. So there's a lot of things to be excited about, a lot of things that we'll look forward to. And uh, just to give you a better flavor of, uh, of some of those things, I'd like to, uh, to introduce our panel. Um, some, of the, uh, some of the perspectives from the industry, some of the perspectives from the, uh, from the air navigation service providers, and of course, uh, my own perspective as a regulator. And to begin these discussions, I'd like to introduce Rich Dalbello. Rich is the, uh, the vice president of, um, of uh, help me out, I just lost my piece of paper, Rich. <laughs> I should have known that government affairs. So I'm also uh, very honored to work with Rich on a uh, ICAO space learning group uh, along with, with Nico and, and Oscar. Uh, so we'll tell you all a little bit more about that in the course of our discussions today. Rich, over to you. Uh, many, well, first of all, good afternoon. It's great to be here in snowy Montreal. I was, uh, I was amazed to actually get in this morning and I'm wondering whether I'm going to be able to escape tomorrow, but uh, Montreal is such a lovely place. I guess I don't mind if I get stuck here. Um, the environment that Dee described is very, very much, I think, uh, an accurate uh, representation of what's going on in the United States in the regulatory realm. Um, there's very much of an active dialogue between the industry and AST at the FAA. Um, there are so many different permutations of space travel. We have suborbital systems, orbital systems, return vehicles. We have in-space vehicles. We're talking now about manufacturing and robotics in space and space uh, assembly of structures. And so there's such a tremendously complicated dialogue that it is very, very hard for AST with 100 people to keep track of everything that's all going on. And as Dee pointed out, it's not just AST. Uh, we fly hybrid systems, so we are also working with AST internally to the FAA to talk to the people who do experimental aircraft and the people who, of course, need to be intimately involved with us so that we have access to airspace. And so th these dialogues are very complicated and they're all going. And I just want to say that it's a tremendous uh, collaboration that we have with AST and we feel tremendously supported by our regulator. I think it's very much um, a different um, uh, relationship than you find in some other industries. But I wanted to talk a little bit about Virgin today. Uh, Richard Branson, uh, the founder of the company, got engaged about a decade ago and got fascinated with the concept of human spaceflight um, for, to, as he would put it, to democratize access to space. So I think in the totality of uh, the, ever since the beginning of the space age, only slightly over 500 people have flown to space, and we have more people signed up for that. Um, we have more people signed up to fly on our vehicle than, than that number. So I think his vision was always to open space up to, to, peop, to, to more people. So from that uh, beginning, uh, we've actually morphed into a group of companies now. There's Virgin Galactic, which is pursuing the original uh, idea of Richard Branson to do suborbital human space flights. And I'll talk in detail about that. We have Virgin Orbit, 
which is focused on the industry that Dee was talking about, the explosion of small satellite, the demand for access for small satellites. Some satellites so small you could hold it in your hand, uh, others the size of maybe a small refrigerator, but still very, very much smaller than what had traditionally been thought of as, as satellites. Um, TSC is the manufacturing entity that actually builds the spaceships for the Virgin Galactic and Vox Space because working with governments is complicated and it requires a different approach than a commercial approach. Vox Space is focused on that DOD and uh, government marketplace. So let's talk a little bit about Virgin Galactic. We rolled out our most recent vehicle in February of 2016, and this is the vehicle that's currently in flight test. Uh, you may recall that the spaceship, as we call it, is attached to a, to a special aircraft, which we refer to as White Knight, uh, and that ba uh, the, the flight profile is the White Knight and the spaceship take off from a normal runway. Um, they climb to about 50,000 feet where you drop the spaceship. Um, the spaceship then lights its in, uh, engine and pretty much flies straight up to space, defined as you will uh, 80 to 100 kilometers. Um, and uh, when it gets, uh, actually this one's slightly out of order, this is when it's coming down. It actually has a rotating tail. It's, it's a little bit like a, a, a shuttlecock in badminton that when it re-enters the earth, it rights itself naturally and it also bleeds off a lot of energy so you don't have a very complicated uh, re-entry system, uh, thermal loading on the re-entry system. But at Apogee, this is the view that something like this is the view that you would have. And that's the view that people want to go and see their planet uh, floating in the darkness of space. So on the return, it, it returns uh, very much like an airplane and it lands uh, again at a normal runway. Um, we have a group of incredibly experienced pilots. I think um, I don't think there's an experimental aircraft that this crew has not, that someone in this crew has not flown. Pretty much every amazing aircraft you could think of, our team has flown once or, once or more than that. Uh, we have a beautiful spaceport in New Mexico. We're actually doing the flight testing in Mojave where the manufacturing is, but it's our hope that this year we'll be soon moving down to New Mexico to operate commercially out of Spaceport America. Um, so a little bit for, yeah, I know this is an air traffic conference, so maybe if you'll bear with me, I'll talk a little bit about how do we operate in, sp in the normal airspace with a space vehicle. So first of all, we sighted our space station in a place where it was very easy to do that. So there's restric restrictive, restricted airspace both north and east of Spaceport America. Uh, we are working with uh, the New Mexico Spaceport Authority, um, and they help us schedule um, uh, airspace usage with w the White Sands Missile Range, which is also adjacent. And the uh, use of the national airspace system is coordinated with uh, the Albuquerque Air Route Traffic Control Center in a, in a relatively normal fashion. So what does a pro flight profile look like? So we, we get our clearance. We are in restricted airspace when we take off. We climb to about 35,000 feet. Uh, at that point, we leave restricted airspace and enter the uh, national airspace. Um, and then when we climb to almost 50,000 feet, then the White Knight would pull up. Uh, we would re-enter into restricted airspace. The White Knight would pull up, drop the spaceship, light the engine, and then uh, the spaceship would proceed to its mission. The White Knight would exit restricted airspace and hold there until the spaceship comes back down. And then um, they would both uh, land. So we really do spend really minimal time in the national airspace for this vehicle. 
So let's switch vehicles. This one's a little bit more complicated. So this is the vehicle uh, we designed to try to address the small satellite market. Originally, we thought of launching this vehicle off the White Knight, but it, the White Knight just really isn't big enough. We did a detailed market assessment and decided we needed to have something in the three to, three to 500 kilogram range, which is where the peak demand is for this marketplace. We looked at all kinds of different carrier platforms. We decided at the end of the day that we'd use a 747. Um, the, uh, the rocket is actually very simple. Um, it's uh, liquid oxygen and kerosene. Weighs, it's about 70 foot long, weighs about 55,000 pounds. It's an all composite uh, rocket. Um, this is our airplane. We actually um, did, we did do a global search and it just happened that Virgin Atlantic was the airplane. They had an airplane coming out of service that was a great price with a great record. And it happened to be called Cosmic Girl. So we figured that if that was a uh, destiny. So we, we decided to buy it. And turns out if you're in the market, you can get a 747 pretty cheap these days. So if you want to get some, a gift for someone for Christmas, it's, uh, there's a real sale on those now. Um, here's the the, a, the first uh, what we call our test test mockup of the of the first rocket, our Pathfinder rocket, um, in our factory in Long Beach, California. Um, that again on this one, the operations are very very different from a normal launch vehicle. So in a normal launch vehicle, you have uh, fixed a fixed launch site with lots of um, uh, resources and capabilities and tracking ability. What we have, on the other hand, is a few trailers, uh, which basically come out to the runway. And I mean, the the rocket is mounted on the aircraft and, and then and it's rolled out empty to the runway. The trailers come up and law and fuel the uh, fuel the rocket, and then you're you're ready to go. Um, our notional flight path is we'll fly out of Mojave about 60 miles to. Um, the uh, ocean and there we will be coordinating with the Naval Air Warfare Center and that's restricted airspace there. We'll go out, we'll climb to about 35,000 feet, we'll do one loop to test winds aloft and then drop the rocket and go. We're limited in this spaceport to polar trajectories and we are looking for another spaceport uh, to do equatorial launch. Uh, we don't need um, ground controls uh, uh, stations. This vehicle will be using uh, exclusively an autonomous flight safety system. So if anything goes wrong with the rocket, it, it, it actually has to be, everything has to be working for the fuel to remain open. As soon as anything goes wrong, the fuel closes and the rocket just stops going. So um, we will, I mean, these kinds of systems have been tested before, but no one's relied exclusively on it yet. And so this will be a first. So the great thing about uh, an air launch vehicle is you're very flexible, and the aircraft gives you tremendous range, several thousand kilometers. So this is a notional chart with, uh, with us based in Puerto Rico uh, for equatorial launch. So anyway, there's a tremendous amount of work to do. Uh, we work, again, as I said, with AST on the regulatory. We work with AVS in the, um, uh, in the FAA because our uh, vehicles are characterized as experimental aircraft. And we work with ATO, the Air Traffic Organization, because we will fly, um, even in a limited fashion, we will use some national airspace. So, it, so far, it's been a great collaboration. And we hope to get both of these vehicles flying successfully in 2018. So hopefully the next time I come back to ICAO, I'm showing you beautiful pictures of both these vehicles successfully flying. And I look forward to taking questions maybe later, right? Thank you very much. Rich, thank you very much. Um, really an interesting presentation. Um, I next like to, uh, I'd like to introduce our next panelist, Mr. Oscar Garcia, who is the chairman and CEO of Interflight Global. Um, Oscar is involved with a number of activities in the commercial space environment, including serving as chairman of uh, Fast Forward and uh, chairman of the uh, Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee Standards Working Group. 
Um, he's been involved with uh, ASTM, which is a standard setting body that is, uh, is, is currently focusing on uh, industry consensus standards for commercial space. Uh, and uh, Oscar is also an airline transport pilot with over um, 7,500 hours of flight. Please join me in welcoming Oscar Garcia. Hi, good afternoon. Um, I know this is before the coffee break, so I'll try to make it uh, quick and interesting. Um, it's an honor to be here today at ICAO, a venue I know of uh, working for the last 30 years in the air transportation industry and serving on this uh, distinguished panel and being a guest speaker. I'd like to uh, uh, echo a couple of things uh, Richard said. Uh, I used to fly 747-400, so I appreciate uh, your comments, and I think Cosmic Girl, Cosmic Girl will do just fine. Uh, my presentation is, um, I hope, um, takes the... Uh, commercial space transportation conversation into a context that is understandable by the civil aviation authorities and air navigation service providers present here at ICAO. So like Richard said, the, the commercial space uh, transportation industry is, is a very, very varied ecosystem. So in my presentation, I'm going to focus on the um, concept of operations that could be a logical evolution of air transportation as we know it today. So. I'm going to focus on commercial high-speed flight. And uh, probably most of you have seen some of these uh, pictures, um, aircraft that fly faster and higher than what we are used to. Um, aircraft, uh, subsonic aircraft flying below 50,000 feet is a common management issue for ANSPs and CAAs. Therefore, all this ecosystem of different architectures and possibilities start opening up. I'm going to narrow down today to those vehicles, those uh, concepts that could be a logical evolution for flying faster and higher than we do today. So a couple of considerations, and uh, um, yesterday we had an interesting presentation from a supersonic aircraft manufacturer, Boom. Um, I'd like to, to mark up a couple of uh, comments there from, from people that most of us in this room will know. Dennis Muhlenberg, CEO and Chairman of Boeing, uh, recently, no more than a month ago, uh, states that hyper hypersonic passengers' planes could be here in 10 years. I think in the next decade or two, we are going to see them as a reality. Elon Musk of SpaceX, an offset, uh, is planning to fly London to New York rocket flights in 29 minutes, and there is his uh, planned uh, network, Tokyo mm -hmm. to New York, 37 minutes. Some of you might have seen the videos, not only in YouTube, but also in mainstream media, TV, and other channels. So th th these names are uh, names that carry weight and uh, opinion in the industry. Uh, so I'm now going to tell you my thoughts after uh, su being supported by, by uh, uh, the previous ones. And these thoughts will set up the next uh, 10 minutes or so of presentation. Um, I, I believe that uh, there is an appetite for speed in the world, in the world of air transport, in the world in general, in the digital world we live in. We want things faster, quicker, um, and more immediate. It's no different in the air transportation industry. So. My, my belief is that the evolution from subsonic uh, commercial core uh, um, transportation of people and goods will be a, a logical evolution, not a revolution. It will be evolutionary from transonic aircraft, uh, supersonic, hypersonic, and then eventually the logical next high speed increment will come from space transportation. So we call that point to point or uh, one point on Earth to another, just like air, the air transportation system is today. Um, I believe that uh, uh, by the 2050s we will see a routine flying uh, between Mach 5 and Mach, Mach 10, reducing uh, flight times by a factor of 10. So. This presentation is going to take you uh, through the different brackets of uh, high-speed transportation, uh, air transportation, that take us logically into space, near space, and then higher and higher space. I'll define those brackets, and I'll try to, to shed some light into which ones of these programs are real in terms of which ones of these programs are market-demanded, are market-driven, who has bought these, these new concepts already, and then we'll move further into the timeline and into the conceptual uh, projects that might still need a market down the line. 
So uh, the architectures that I'll describe, and just to, there is a number, there is a probably a dozen of projects out there, but uh, to, to be precise today, I narrowed down the focus on the presentation on uh, a, a, a simple architecture similar to air transportation aircraft as we use them today, which will be fixed wing, horizontally launched with powered capabilities for landing, diversion, and go-arounds. And uh, the trajectories considered uh, will be similar to an aircraft today. Departure to and from airports, uh, standard instrument departures, arrivals, in insertion in the terminal airspace, and then at some point, gateways to a higher and faster realm that we've been discussing here for the last couple of days. And we'll then have some conclusions, uh, but always keeping the, the global air navigation uh, plan focus as, as ICAO is looking at 2019 to make some changes. I'm going to focus more on the nearer term um, high speed flying in near space. So, here is a, a little chart. Um, it, by the way, there, there are some slides that are dense in information. You'll have this presentation, so let me just go over the basics. Um, th these are the, the next four segments that the air and space transportation point-to-point -point industry predicts. Um, the first one is the transonic segment, and this segment is here today. We have a commercial aircraft flying routinely uh, above Mach decimal 9 and, and Mach 1. I'll show you those later. The altitude is below 50,000 feet, and that concept is existing, is fully integrated in the uh, national airspace and global airspace through SARPs, ICAO, and the time is now. Now, the evolution to supersonic is the nearest term uh, uh, evolution that I believe is Mach 1 to Mach 3. It takes us below that 65,000 feet realm that we are all used to, so the, the integration should not be that difficult. And the time frame for that is 2025, especially when we have the Concorde experience for a couple of decades we've been flying routine, scheduled, common carriage uh, transportation. Then we move into hypersonics, which is Mach 3 to Mach 5, and that goes below 100,000 feet. Now, that's the 60 to 100,000 feet realm we need to start defining into procedures and operations. That's a completely new realm for, the, for a GAMP, and, uh, and the time frame for those programs is 2035 or so. And from there on, we move on into the use of near space, uh, which is the suborbital range, and then there we have a couple of segments, the long range, uh, 4,000 miles flight between Mach 5 and Mach 10, below 500,000 feet, completely new realm, 2040s, and the ultra-long range, Mach 10 and above, above 500,000 feet, completely new environment, and it, that's more for the 2050s decade. So, uh, along the presentation, I'll discuss some of the main challenges that, that these uh, new technologies present. Te te technical, the main challenge is propulsion. Environmental, noise and pollution. What footprint are we living at what altitudes and for how long? Uh, economic, uh, costs and current markets. And here I will show you who is really selling these vehicles today and who is trying to look for mar possible markets. And then, in the context of the GAN, conversation we have, we'll talk about integration uh, into the next generation systems such as SWIM, SWIM next gen, CSR, etc. in the terminal area, uh, in and route, uh, as well as high altitude. I'll stop from starting to define what high altitude space is. We had enough of that yesterday, uh, but anyway. So let me take you through a few minutes of what's happening globally in the high speed transportation in near space. So this is where we need to integrate. This is the current air transportation today. is uh, working quite well, thanks to the ICAO efforts, as well as all the local uh, civil aviation authorities. And uh, let's get started with what we know. Uh, if I show you this aircraft, most of you know a couple of them, at least. These airplanes are flying today uh, between Mach, 9, uh, Mach 0.9 and Mach 1. That call, that's called transonic. And all of them have been tested to supersonic speed. So for all practical purposes, these are quasi-supersonic aircraft already in service, flying around the world uh, up to 75 nautical miles, which is 18 hours of flight time non-stop. So the, the uh, air transportation industry in general, um, uh, range and comfort, we are there. We can fly, uh, I think Boeing's next 777X flies London, Sydney in 22 hours nonstop. We can fly it very comfortably. The range is not the issue. Comfort is not the issue. What the market is asking for is speed. So this chart shows you uh, on the top right uh, hand corner of the chart, it 
shows you the demand for very high speed, ultra long range aircraft. This is data from 2017 from Honeywell, presented at the NBAA last uh, uh, October. And the appetite for speed is there. Those are aircraft orders, uh, uh, aircraft uh, that have been paid for and slots that are being manufactured. So the world is asking for speed. Now, let's move into the supersonic realm, which I think is, will be the most relevant area for consideration for any uh, global air navigation plan adjustments. Uh, we all know about Concorde. This realm is Mach 1 to Mach 3, below 65,000 feet, and about 4,000 nautical miles. The profile you see there, a typical 747, uh, and the profile of the Concorde is right above it. Nothing new. Those are the North Atlantic tracks Concorde used to operate. That's an actual flight plan for a Concorde. 20 years doing this is going to be quite uh, relatively easy to integrate commercial aircraft which are certified into AOCs that uh, civil aviation authorities know. So uh, supersonic is coming. There are a number of, of, of projects uh, looking into it. Let me point at the two that have shown market response and actually have sold the supersonic con uh, 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 concept. So the first one is Arion Corporation. It's a collaboration with Airbus. And Flexjet, uh, a very, very reputable charter company, has placed orders for 20 aircraft worth 2.4 billion. This is a Mach 1.6 aircraft. will be fully certified to FAA and EASA and worldwide standards and entering service somewhere around 2022, 2025. So, speed is coming and these are real market uh, uh, sales. Yesterday we saw a uh, boom showing us uh, the uh, supersonic airliner 55 seat concept and to uh, Richard's uh, uh, credit uh, there's, there's an order for uh, 20 um, aircraft uh, from Virgin Atlantic. Uh, I'm sorry, 10 for Virgin Atlantic and 20 from Japan Airlines. Um, I don't know if we have anybody from uh, Japan, from uh, the UK, but the civil aviation authorities of those countries and ANSPs will need to uh, integrate these aircraft into, the, into their airspaces, uh, projected in service by the mid-2020s. So these are real orders, real programs that are starting to manufacture um, speed. So. From supersonic, we move to hypersonic, the realm between 60 and 100,000 feet, Mach 3 to Mach 5, very long range. And these are concepts that could be, that are interesting, that are being developed and researched pretty much on paper uh, because simply the market has not yet purchased them or placed orders for them. It's uh, interesting technologies, both propulsion and airframes. And uh, at these speeds between 2030 and 2035, the world will be uh, probably half of the size it is today if we achieve to fly between Mach 3 and Mach 5. This is a program in the business jet area uh, on the hypersonic uh, realm. It's uh, called the Sonic Star. It's an electric uh, uh, superconducting uh, power plant. Same concept, Mach 5. Yet not a market for it, pure research and development project, but that takes us already to 100,000 feet, where somebody could agree is near space, and around the world at Mach 5 in two hours. So uh, the Japanese uh, exploration agency is working on two concepts, one for an airliner, one for a business jet at Mach 3 to 5. Uh, we just had them speak at our fast forward group uh, two weeks ago. Pure research and development, but no market for it yet. Looking mostly into the 2030, 2035 time frame. Uh, very innovative engines still to be proven. And uh, from hypersonic, we move into suborbital. And this is uh, where things start getting very interesting because we are starting to talk about trajectories and flight plans that will be anywhere to anywhere on Earth uh, under two hours with winged vehicles that take off and land exactly like aircraft. Uh, reaction engines in the UK is developing a power plant that looks promising. and. Uh, developments are continuing. But again, the market in the air transportation side, uh, common carriage has not yet expressed interest. This shows you a little bit the last three. The hypersonic on the bottom is a straight line point to point. And then the suborbital has two possible uh, trajectories. One of them is oscillating up and down the atmosphere, skipping. Uh, that's the lower altitude one I presented. The higher altitude one is a ballistic trajectory. And again, the high speed point to point uh, concept using space as a transition is, is of interest to, to industry. And the markets are looking at, at those concepts uh, closely. 
So that's the typical trajectory of a suborbital vehicle uh, with a, a conventionally powered departure from an airport fully integrated in the airspace at the airline speed, similar to what Concord did till it got to the gateways in the North Atlantic, and from there on shooting up in a suborbital path, which is the new realm we need to start defining and integrating into uh, the thinking, and then coming down on a hypersonic glide to turn up the uh, uh, conventional jet power into the uh, terminal area like another aircraft. Again, we are talking about 2030 to 2040, so that's a little, that's the next step. So as a conclusion, uh, I'd like to um, to put it in the context of what, what can ICAO and the civil aviation authorities in 2019 uh, take about emerging trends into high speed, high altitude, near space flights. Um, my view is that we need to integrate the new concepts uh, well within the 60,000 uh, feet realm, both on the uh, departure and uh, arrival as well as in route segments. Um, the good thing is, uh, or news, is that we have technology on our side. All the next-gen uh, uh, information exchange systems, uh, system-wide information management, thanks to the data, big data uh, processing capacity we have, integrating high speed for tactical resolutions at a very high speed, doesn't seem like a daunting technical uh, uh, challenge. Um, I'd like to, to add that uh, in order to incorporate or integrate this type of technologies into our uh, civil aviation authorities or space agency thinking, uh, what has proven very effective for us in the U.S. is a, a very a close collaboration between industry and the regulator. Um, industry drives the needs and the concepts that I just showed you. Industry defines what is the market asking for, uh, what vehicles have been sold and why they need to, to fly. Uh, the regulator listens and accepts uh, information exchange as uh, we do in the U.S. with the Commercial Space Transportation Advisory Committee. And um, eventually, um, industry produces a uh, Consensus standards as solutions to some of the challenges these vehicles are going to present, and those standards will be the means of compliance in the future for the regulator or civil aviation authority or air navigation safety provider. So it's an industry app approach where the realities of the market and the industry needs dictate what we need to be regulated on or uh, standardized on, rather than having a prescriptive approach from theoretical possible new concepts. This is, we fly a little, we test a little, and then we regulate a little. So um, to put it as a, in perspective, uh, what are we talking about here? Um, this is not going to be hundreds of thousands of airplanes, not even tens of thousands of airplanes or vehicles. All the market research we do at Interfly Global uh, uh, in, in terms of, of, of metrics, uh, the, the high speed, high altitude commercial transportation segment between now and the 2050 period could amount to 10 to 15 percent of the global uh, fleet. Even considering the growth in air transportation, we would be looking at 6,000 to 10,000 vehicles Ev everywhere, uh, high altitude, higher altitude, and near space. So is it a manageable problem? I believe so. I think the key will be to allow industries, developments to guide uh, the problems, to produce the standards to solve those problems, and eventually have regulations that those standards can act as means of uh, compliance. So I think my time is up. I won't show you a couple of videos. When you get the presentation, there are a couple of very interesting videos uh, with a uh, more pictorial review of uh, what I just said. But uh, thank you very much for your time. And again, it's an honor to be here today. Oscar, thank you. Fascinating, uh, fascinating presentation. Next panelist I'd like to introduce is Nico Vorbach. Nico is the uh, CANSO director here at ICAO uh, and is responsible uh, for that relationship as well as industry affairs. 
Uh, in his role uh, for Canto, he's representing the interests of the air navigation service providers uh, on the issues that come before ICAO uh, and operates in a very similar fashion to other uh, organizations like ACI and, and IATA. Uh, before joining Canso, Nico had a very long and distinguished uh, career as a 23-year uh, career as a, a pilot and ended up flying uh, the Boeing 777. Nico, over to you. Thank you, Dee, and I uh, would like to thank uh, ICAO as well for inviting us to uh, speak on this uh, Ganis Sanis. And it is also very interesting to speak during this time in uh, history. We see so many changes in the world, especially in the aviation world, but the technology is going so fast that regulatory is always behind. What you buy today on the uh, Technology is already old-fashioned. We see things happening so fast that we really have to be very adaptive to our regulations, and that's a bit what I want to talk about. So when we talk about commercial space, I want to talk a bit first about uh, 100 kilometers and space, so that's the real space operations, commercial space operations. Then the part between flight level 600 and 100 kilometers, what is happening there? We heard, already heard yesterday a lot of uh, discussions about balloons, about solar power planes, uh, and other um, issues that are brought into that realm, and also the uh, uh, hypersonic aircraft that uh, are going to fly there, and supersonic aircraft. And how do we integrate that in the system uh, that we have now? How do we integrate it in commercial aviation? Because everything that goes to that area has to pass by the commercial uh, aviation space that we have now. So what risks does that give to us to commercial uh, aviation that we have at the moment and where should we look and what should we regulate or what should we investigate further to see how we can mitigate those risks. And Then I end up with a bit of a conclusion what we think should be uh, some of the ways that we uh, have to look forward. We all know, and we heard it yesterday, we heard it today, space is getting busier and busier. It's getting more and more commercial aviation of commercial space operations than we had before. Before, we had states who launched from their own territory a space object, so they close the airspace around it, and they make sure that their space object is going up, and they are liable and responsible for the operations. Now we see the shift from governments sending it up to commercial uh, entities, creating those vehicles and also sending those vehicles up. What kind of uh, complications give that to us and where should we look into that changes? At the moment we see about 80 launches a year, which is a lot. If you look before we had uh, uh, a lot less and we saw that also uh, from um, uh, Rich before, it is increasing uh, rapidly. There are already about 1,400 satellites in operation, mostly high, but also on the lower altitudes. And you see those big constellations being developed, either by SpaceX, OneApp, other, uh, Arian, Iridium. They're all sending up uh, satellites more and more. So it's getting very busy, and we're getting um, more and more hazards of collisions, but also of space objects coming down. Because when I was young, I was told by my father, be careful with because what goes up also have to come down. Even Space Lab came down one time. So we have a lot of space operations. We have space tourism. Uh, we talk about uh, from uh, Virgin uh, that it's looking into bringing people up. Um, so how do we deal with that? You already saw a lot of those spaces and it's not science fiction anymore. It's not the Millennium Falcon. It is uh, really things that are going to happen, not science fiction. And more and more launches are being prepared, and we hear in 2022, 2025, we really see a lot of those space operations going on. That is all going through airspace and going to an area that is called space and where we have the space law or the space convention dealing with it. If we look at the area between flight level 600 and 100 kilometers, we see a gap in legislation. Most FIRs or UIRs, 
where air traffic control is managed goes up to maximum flight level 600. Above, we have a gap in who is controlling, who is taking care of it, and who is making the separation and the safety. Yeah, we see balloons that float around. We see uh, Aquila from uh, Facebook that goes with 20, kilo uh, 20 miles an hour in that area. We see uh, stationary balloons, and then we see supersonic jets going there. How do we manage that? Do we have to create a new near space traffic management system, or do we let air traffic management system that we are now, ANSPs that we have now, manage that area? Do we have to lift the UER uh, up to a level that they can manage that party as well? I come back uh, later on that to see what kind of risk we are, but we have to see what we have to do. Do we have to new, to create a new legislation on the area between flight level 600 and 100 kilometers, or, as I said, do we have to take into account territorial and, um, areas and the control of an ANSPs that we have now? If we are flying supersonic, I think the fact that we have the normal ANSPs doesn't work because within two minutes you're out of sometimes your FIR. So perhaps we should see if we can have a regional cooperation between uh, ANSPs in the different uh, uh, continents that we have. We have to look into that. We have to be ready when it really starts operating in a high uh, velocity that we think thousands to ten thousands of uh, aircraft going to that area. So how do we integrate it? We have to have clear rules about um, what kind of equipment do, does those space um, vehicles need? What kind of procedures do they follow? What kind of tracks do they follow? And how does it interact with the uh, commercial space when they pass through a very busy uh, airspace? So we need close cooperation and cooperation between the organizations who are making space traffic management if we have that, and the air traffic management. And we cannot really close an airspace for a long time because even aviation is going to double in the next 15 years. We have to find out if we have a aviation law or space law for that area. And we have to consider how to integrate commercial space operations into our ATM system. And minimizing the impact for them, they cannot be waiting for hours to launch because they have a special hole that they have to use, but also we cannot stop the normal commercial aviation. And we have to keep and maintain and perhaps even increase our level of safety in the commercial aviation that we have now. To have this integration of very slow moving objects going up to flight level 600 or the supersonic aircraft, we have to change or update ATM uh, software perhaps and we have to train our traffic controllers to be able to see the difference between a balloon that goes floating at flight level 600, a supersonic jet that goes at uh, Mark 3 or a Aquila um, solar powered plane that goes in 20 miles an hour and within four minutes it is 100 kilometers uh, closer. So we really have to train air traffic controllers and use all the technology and artificial intelligence that we can have to manage that problem and to make sure that they are safe and separated from each other. If we go faster, we also have to do separation, uh, not based on length, but based on time. Time separation is one that we have to go. Surveillance is very important. We have to constantly know where they are and not every three minutes or every five minutes. We have a constant view of where all the objects that we have in space are at the moment. And being able to coordinate the small, slow ones with the fast, bigger ones. And we have to have contingency planning. The more you bring up, and as I said, what goes up comes down. We have to have contingency planning when there is a unplanned uh, descent from the higher space through the commercial space. So what is the risk? Well, a satellite can have an uncontrolled air uh, entry. You can have stratospheric balloons that suddenly goes down. Uh, we have winged pseudo satellites that can malfunction and come down at a place that you don't want. Um, if you have rocket space that uh, rocket uh, stages that comes down at an unpredicted time, 
if you uh, look at some launches that went down, uh, wrong, you have to be able to have a clear path for the uh, descent of that uh, object. And then we have falling space debris. The more you bring up, although the debris is there, uh, it all comes down. And I come back to that later. But NASA says that approximately once a day, an object of about 10, kilo, uh, 10 kilograms falls down on Earth again from space. So that debris, we should not increase it. Perhaps we should clean it. And we should be uh, able to track it when it comes down for uh, uh, re-entry to our atmosphere. This is a picture that I uh, uh, have to see a bit about the uh, different uh, risks that we have in aviation and that perhaps we are increasing because we bring more and more into the higher ice space. As I said, one piece of about five kilo falls down to Earth every day. Uh, two to five percent is the estimate you'll increase of the out, uh, amount of space junk. And there are presently approximately uh, 25,000, it was 22,000 in 2011, 11 of 10 centimeters or more floating around our world, floating around our uh, atmosphere. Next thing, we were talking about uh, space ports, but you see also commercial space operations who want or say they can land on any airport that has a 737 capability of landing. So how do we create procedures that keep the other commercial space that go uh, with a less um, approach angle and a less speed uh, apart from each other. Can it be integrated in normal airports? Do we have to have uh, separated areas? Do we have to have restricted areas for spaceports? All things that we have to be developing and be ready when we have commercial space really uh, increasing. And as I said, we cannot like NASA does now and the, with their launches, close an airspace for three, four, five hours for commercial space so that all the routes that are going through there, all aircraft have to be uh, uh, derouted. Yeah, we have to be careful of economical consequences for the airlines for rerouting, but also the economical, environmental, uh, other issues. So in conclusion, it is a fast-growing uh, industry with a very great potential and it's helping us as the normal aviation industry to have new uh, efficiency, and new uh, equipment, new technologies that help us increase our work, but we have to integrate it safely and securely into our environment that we have. So the regulations need to be finished in 2019-2020 to have the ability to increase the amount of commercial space and launches and operations in the near space in 2020-25 when it started to do. If we have a space traffic management, there has to be a very good cooperation with the air traffic management. And as I said, perhaps we should have it integrated, but at least there should be a very good cooperation and collaboration between those two entities. We need regulation and guidance for spaceports airports if they are able to uh, have space operations. As I said, the air traffic controllers, but perhaps also pilots and other people in the aviation need to know the capabilities and the uh, environment where the new entries are working in. Perhaps we need new separation standards because of the speed that all those uh, aircraft will uh, having and the differences in speed. And we need to have contingencies procedures for something if it goes wrong. And that can be uh, technology-based, but it, can, uh, it also has to be developed and be maintained by humans. Thank you very much. Nico, thank you. And I think I'm going to ask Leon, with your forbearance, if we could uh, uh, maybe table this discussion. Um, I'm aware of uh, that there is a coffee break. Um, but I'm doing this with uh, a thought that many of the ideas that you've had are going to be continue to be built on um, Leon's presentation, very exciting presentation from Worldview. 
and our other panelists, Li Hao. Um, so I want you all, if you would, just over the next 20 minutes or so, or 25 until you come back, to think about some of the things you've heard. We're going to build on them. And then we're going to start a discussion on you know, what, what is myth and what is reality. So with that, um, thank you all very, very much for your kind attention. And I want to thank uh, Frequentus in advance for their sponsoring of the coffee break. And we'll see you back in here at 3.30. Thank you. <laughs>